Hi, I'm Yolanda and this is Speak On. In 2016, Kylie Jenner said, I feel like every year has a new energy and I feel like this year is really about like the year of realising stuff and everyone around me, we're all just like realising things. People mocked her for her introspection, but it turns out she is a prophet and Kylie was really just living four years ahead because 2020 is actually the year of realising stuff and things. Not only are we realising it en masse, we're realising it together and we're talking about it at length. We've been galvanised into action. We're voting with our feet and turning our back on unethical brands. We're pushing for policy change. We're fighting against fascism. We're protesting. We're petitioning. We're making changes to be greener. So we stop losing huge swathes of the planet to fires. Well, the ones that aren't based on genital reveals. Congrats, by the way. It's a boy. Goodbye, California. Many of the things that have sparked these actions and conversations would at some point by some people been seen as a conspiracy theory. So it's time for me to hold up my hand and say, my name is Yolanda and I am a conspiracy theorist. Prior to June 2020, I talked about the conspiracy theory, systemic racism and white supremacy. Despite lived experience, footage, historical documents, documentaries and countless pieces of evidence, When I talked about it, people looked at me like I was insane. Why? One, because white people are always really surprised by the shit that white people do in the name of racism and to hold on to power. And two, because it sounds insane. People would launch actual racist verbal attacks on me for pointing out that something was bigoted. They would change the subject or gaslight me about my personal experiences. Then the world was at home and they saw the truth. And truth is stranger than fiction. I mean, a few years ago, would we have believed the stories about Prince Andrew being friends with a billionaire paedophile who had a private island that presidents and celebrities visited that was used for sex trafficking, who killed himself in air quotes? (laughs) No, we wouldn't have. But here we are in 2020, just all here, just realising things. So amongst the multi-level marketing posts and memes on Facebook, we've seen people scrapping over whether COVID is real, which celebrity is trying to steal your children, How much of it's true? Who knows? How do we separate fact from fiction? Are these people all mad? Today, in case you haven't worked it out, we're discussing conspiracy theories. And I'm joined by Danny Price, a social commentator, presenter, comedian and entrepreneur, and Dr. Daniel Jolly, a senior lecturer in psychology who specialises in the psychology of conspiracy theories. Welcome. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. (laughs) How are you both doing today? (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, who's going to go first? Yeah, who's exactly. Go first? Okay, exactly. Like, like, I'll go, I'll go first. You go, you go, yeah. you go I'm for it. I'm fantastic. I'm on day three of my water fast right now, so I'm very, very hungry and chewing yeah. the inside of my mouth. But other than that, I'm great. <laughs> oh my gosh, and how are you, Daniel? I'm doing good as well. You find me during a, a, a localised lockdown up in Newcastle and Tyne mm-hmm. in the UK. So it's a, a nice, interesting time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots of, t- you, can, you know, you're at home realising stuff. Yeah, I'm at home realising stuff. Realising that you can't go out, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, mostly that. (laughs) But you can can go hunting. Well, yeah. Yeah. Strangely, so I can't wait for that. Exactly. Oh, man. There are ways around it. Everyone go out, but in a school uniform. You'll be fine. (laughs) No one will question it. It sounds like Freshers Week. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I'm getting out my tweed as we speak. Yeah, (laughs) amazing. Can't wait to shoot a few birds. Okay, so conspiracy theories. I'm going to start with Daniel. So, Daniel, what is a conspiracy theory? No, that is kind of a loaded question because there are many different ways to define what a conspiracy theory actually is. Kind of scholarly definitions kind of are based around the idea that events or issues can be explained by something as a secret force doing something sinister for their own good as opposed to explaining something that's more mundane. So in essence, it's something large has happened where there's a secret group doing something bad that's against the rest of us. So it can be silly ones, like the idea that the moon landing didn't happen, or it can obviously be more serious, the idea that vaccines are dangerous because the data has been faked. 
So it's that, in essence, it's that secret group acting in secret, which could be the government, mm -hmm. but it also could be other groups of people. So the doctors, but also diff different status people, such as there's many conspiracies about Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the governments, it can be a whole range of groups. Mm -hmm. And then why do people believe in them? So why do people believe in conspiracies? That is, that is a crazy question in an essence, because there's so many different answers. But the first point is, whilst paranoia is associated, it's not the only reason. Because many, many, many people believe in conspiracy narratives. With regards to COVID-19, there's a whole host of different conspiracies. And that's because conspiracies emerge in times of crisis. In essence, where we are feeling uncertain, threatened, anxious. It's when we're looking for answers. And a conspiracy narrative can offer a very simple solution to what is a complex problem. So that is why crises across the whole history of our existence has bred these narratives, because it offers reassurances. So in essence, it's people trying to understand the world, which I think is very, it's a thing that we're all trying to do. It's just in the environment of, for example, a pandemic, we may be more drawn to conspiracy narratives. It's also coupled with some personality quirks. So if you have lower critical thinking abilities, you're more drawn to conspiracy narratives. If you already hold mistrust in the society at large, at those who perceive to be powerful, naturally more drawn to conspiracy narratives. And of course, another key ingredient is the event itself. Conspiracy theories are always about big events because a bias in our mind assumes that something big must be explained by something equally as large. So Princess Diana, for example, to argue that she died in a simple car accident doesn't maintain portionality. So when we hear about her death as an example, we're kind of, we're, we're we have a desire to believe it's something as big as what that event is. So again, going back to COVID, of course, it's a large worldwide event. So when we're feeling anxious, uncertain, we think, wow, this big event must be explained by something equally as big, which the real explanation is more complicated. It's not as clean. Experts, you know, will sort of learn. So to believe it's 5G or that it's a government conspiracy kind of, at least temporarily, makes you feel more in control, which... I think is a positive thing of conspiracy narratives that it helps us in that way. Mm -hmm. But of course it can breed mistrust. It can breed us not following guidance and not following social isolation guidance. Us being violent towards who we perceive to be conspiring, which could be the government, but it could be different groups of people like Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So conspiracy narratives, I think are a real complex issue. And it's a long answer to your question of why people believe, but there's no simple answer. Yeah. And to just dismiss people as paranoid doesn't really get to the crux of really why someone has found themselves in this, po in this position. Yeah. And then, uh, Danny, what kind of conspiracy theories have you seen online recently? And do you have any faves? Oh, man. I mean, well, you know, the, the whole thing with the, the, the pandemic and the lockdown in itself, I think... It was even a conspiracy theory that there was going to be this nationwide lockdown. There is even a meme about it. I don't know if you saw it, the in-betweeners meme, when it's like, oh, my mate's working for the government. It's going to be a national lockdown. And me and all my friends was like, just taking the mickey out of it. And two weeks later, and, you know, that it was a lockdown. So I think that one is, is very sort of important because that was like, that was really, really viral. And like in terms like since then, you know, it's just been, it, it has been like the 5G one and the... Um, like, you know, the uh, sort of uh, the government's just doing it to sort of keep you all sort of indoors because they don't want you to go outside. Because there was one that I saw the other day when it was like, oh, there's two sons now. And it was like a video um, of like it was obviously the reflection of the um, of the moon or whatever. And yeah. it just looked like it did look like two sons. But come on. Let's yeah. just be serious. It wasn't. But like the video is it's a, it's a fascinating video. And, this, and then I read the comments and the comments are like people are explaining what, what it actually was. And then other people are like, no, there's two suns there. And I saw like one comment said was, was from a guy who was like a scientist. And he said like the gravitational effect of there being two suns would be devastating. Like it's impossible. It's an impossibility. And another guy is just like, well, you're just planted there by the government, aren't you? And it's like, well, <laughs> come on. Like, don't be silly. Yeah. Um, but like, I think. The, 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 the most popular one is, is got to be the um, the one that, you know, that it's a government created virus. 
um, you know, with the with the aids to with the you know, the aims to get everybody vaccinated and, you know, so they can put a microchip in you and they can trace you. Because it's so ridiculous because, you know, we're basically paying for them to trace us anyway by buying a mobile phone. Yeah. So it just doesn't hold any weight whatsoever. But of course, you can't mm-hmm. argue that point to them. But I think that's no. got to be my favourite one. <laughs> that's true. I've seen that one a lot online and I keep saying to people, but you're on Facebook. Your date yeah. is here. We're giving them, we're, we're paying for the privilege yeah. of being traced. We really exactly. are. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm like, but you're on WhatsApp. And yeah. like, if you, I, I would believe someone that really, that if they really believe that, and I would kind of, I, I suppose I would, I don't know, maybe kind of be a little bit less kind of eyebrow raisy with them if they had a Nokia 3210. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's old school. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Come, come, yeah. Step up to me with the Sony Ericsson and then I'll believe that you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> until then shut up <laughs> so it's yeah. just yeah sitting on your iphone 11 no <laughs> no 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 <laughs> so, so daniel we all know that fact is stranger than fiction um but what causes some like some of these conspiracy theories to take root over others and how does it affect people's behavior what do they do in response So, in essence, what are the key ingredients of a conspiracy? Which, it's that large event. So, things that are mundane, doesn't really matter. There's no conspiracies. There's nothing really that kind of has traction. It has to be a large event. Mm -hmm. And it's also the conspirators need to be kind of a tightly formed group who could potentially do what you're suggesting. Potentially. So, it's never just an individual, me, who who is in low power. It's a group of people who are seen to be acting in something, in some kind of sinister conspiracy. So it could be the government, the the doctors. And these seem to kind of be the telltale signs of a conspiracy that kind of maintains that popularity. So I'm sure if we look now, there's probably a whole range of different theories that exist, but things aren't really kind of hitting, don't really have those key things, which kind of fit that definition of what a conspiracy is. But of course, if you believe that the government is conspiring with COVID, you aren't going to follow what they're going to say because you don't trust them. So when they're saying to us, to you, to isolate if you come infected, to wear masks, because of your distrust towards that that group of people, you're going to ignore what they're saying. Instead, you're going to refer to look towards people who are seen to be similar to you, to those who maybe have similar beliefs or are seen to be an underdog and see what they're saying. So at the start of the pandemic, when the government was saying, you know, stay in, isolate, other kind of sources were saying use alternatives. So there was a whole thing in America with that the drug to use, which, of course, is, is dangerous. And indeed, people did use this said drug, which I'm going to mention, but used it yeah. and obviously uh, were impacted by that. But that's because they are trusting those who are similar. But unfortunately, those who are similar are likely to be experts. So that is one tangible consequence of someone believing in this conspiratorial narrative. But another is the violent aspect. Because, of course, if I believe the government or, the, or whoever it is are conspiring, I want to call them out on that. I want to say to them, you are conspiring. If 5G is causing COVID-19, I want to stop that. And I think that's, in essence, a rational thing to do. But of course, it's based on stuff that's not real. So we know from data that people who believe in these types of conspiracies are more willing and accepting to go out and call out the conspirators. So to go and set a 5G terror alight, to go and be aggressive to the police, because at least in their mindset, that is what makes sense. So it's a rational process in one hand, but of course it's based on inf- information that is not accurate. And of course people are biased. Mm-hmm. When you have your belief, you're motivated to defend it. So if I believe the government is conspiring, my social media feed is likely to be covered in all that, where I'm engaging in that content. And things that go against what I believe, I'm going to be motivated to defend my beliefs and to ignore what they're saying. Now we do that across all our beliefs. Every belief we have, we do that. But it also occurs with conspiracy narratives. So people can find themselves in an echo chamber where they're just subscribing to information that supports their beliefs. And it can be hard to try and change their views because, of course, they're asking questions that they feel are right and they're getting answers they feel are right. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be motivated to hold on to that, Mm -hmm. which, as I say, you can't blame someone for doing that particularly because, of course, they're in their mindset. And a challenge is how we change that, yeah. how we get through to them to to rethink really about the evidence and to be, in essence, critical thinkers. Yeah. 
Uh, and I suppose if someone hasn't got amazing critical skin, uh, thinking skills, they're not going to all of a sudden acquire them either. Are well, they? That's, that's a really excellent <laughs> yeah. point. And, yeah. and of course, you want to say that they, they won't realise that they're lacking those skills as well mm. because they are asking questions, yeah. which they are questions that we should ask. But unfortunately, when they're given the evidence, they're motivated to kind of push back on things that they don't already agree with. Mm-hmm. So the government and the experts coming out to say X, Y and Z about COVID they don't trust them, so they won't engage with them. Yeah. So another, another kind of task is think about who do people actually trust? And maybe health campaigns need to be a whole range of fact, a whole range of stakeholders involved. So it's not just the government who is saying it, but other sources. So, of course, those other groups have to believe the information as well, and it's, it's based on truth. But I think just having one gatekeeper of knowledge is quite problematic because, of course, you've already got that mistrust. And um, I know some people think about, well, if you're already a conspiracy theorist, well, you're kind of gone. Let's not engage with those people, which I don't necessarily agree with. I agree that it's a challenge and it's hard to engage with those people, but it's still really important that we kind of have this dialogue and that we are understanding and this is where where they're coming from. So if you don't understand, okay, you believe in this conspiracy, but why? Why did you get to that point? And it could be that they feel really anxious about what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of trying to deal with the conspiracy, we deal with their feelings, trying to make them not feel as crazy in the world, that they feel so anxious and out of control, that we try and deal with those feelings, that they may help them not be drawn to conspiracy narratives because they're kind of feeling settled, maybe. But of course, that's just theory. We have actually tested that idea. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, we understand why people kind of get to conspiracy narratives. Yeah. But once they're there, it's really hard to change their views, which I think is probably as expected because you're holding on to them tight. Yeah, you know? that's really interesting. But, but it's still important. A few things that you've cut, that you've brought up there, it's made me think what one, what constitutes an expert in a way that's going to please people that already have mm. that mindset. Because then, you know, they, they already don't trust. So what, what, other, what other qualifications can you add to it? How many more experts can you add? And why mm. do they not believe their, like, believe their mm. expertise or their skills mm. um, compared mm. to their GCSE in science? And then <laughs> <laughs> why? But then also it kind of makes me think, I don't know why have they gone to that in the first place? You brought it up, you you know, you made a really good point there. My sister's a clinical psychologist and I saw a few people kind of basically spiraling into mm. various conspiracy mm. theories and various things online. Mm. And when I spoke to my sister about it, because someone that I know, and she was like, oh, she's just really anxious. That's all this is. And she was like, yeah, mm. she's just really anxious. She's She needs an explanation. The ones that are mm. offered to her, she just can't wrap her head around. So mm. this is what's going to, this mm. is what's helping her through it. But she goes, mm. but unfortunately it's actually just making her worse <laughs> because she is making her realize she has even less power than she thought she did yeah. originally. And, Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. It, 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 yeah. it was all quite terrifying. Um, mm. Yeah. So they seem appealing. They yeah. seem really appealing to believe in a conspiracy, but they're potentially not satisfying because mm. that anxiety may at least temporarily be kind of pushed down. But then they'll think, well, what else have the government conspired in? What else have they, they done? Mm. Which they can kind of hampen that. And of course, yeah. we said about expert is really important. So with climate science, there's it's like 98 percent of climate experts say that it's not a hoax. Yeah. I mean, that is not just one or two experts saying this. This is like. So many experts, 98% of experts saying it's, it's not a hoax. Mm-hmm. But of course, people who are motivated to believe it's a hoax will discredit all that. Yeah. That the consensus issue, they don't really pay attention to. They're going to focus on things that support their belief. So that 2%, they're going to hold on to that. When, that, mm-hmm. when in reality, that is a lot, a lot of people saying, no, this is actually happening. Um, but of course, our, our mind is really interesting and it's very complex. And we get ourselves into these situations <laughs> And we hunker down. Um, (laughs) um, And yeah, fascinating. Yeah, it really is. And so Danny, thinking about like online behavior. So what I actually was listening to a podcast recently and they talked about the fact that when it comes to, uh, they were talking about echo chambers and confirmation bias and that relationship with being online, et cetera. And when it comes to being online and using things like Facebook, we now no longer have a natural end to our relationships. Before we'd leave school and then we'd never speak to a certain amount of people. That's it, you'd never see mm-hmm. them again. You'd live the rest of your life and you'd be perfectly goddamn happy. Yeah. Please stop requesting me on yeah. Facebook. Is that, that's, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the context of me saying this sentence. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then... 
But then now people aren't ending those relationships. They're continuing them in this mm. other really weird, facetious, kind of disconnected mm. way. And then you are being exposed to things and people you would usually maybe cut out of your life. Is that affecting us? Is that affecting this yes. behaviour and contributing to it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say, like, so I, I went to school in Wolverhampton. Um, wasn't, like, a very nice place to go to school, realistically. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, obviously, I've moved to London now. I have a completely different life. And all of the people who have opposite views to me are people from school in Wolverhampton. They're the people that are supporting our leading government currently, people who are saying the coronavirus is a hoax. And and it's it's um it is people like the only thing that I could say realistically is I can connect like the sort of investment in conspiracy theories in, in, in like a a dissatisfaction of life in a way. Like I'm very happy with my life and I'm sure you guys are as well. So we don't really buy into that escapism. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's got to be somebody else's fault that I'm not happy and I'm not fulfilled 100%. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that sort of like it's obviously, yeah, we have our echo chambers, but yeah, because of, as you said, we have our relationships with people like from primary school even, um, that are still in our lives, realistically, because most of us are too polite to just be like, um, well, actually, no, I've got loads of requests that are still on pending. I just can't, I haven't got it in me to say no, but I haven't got it in me to say yes, but they can just stay right there. But, um, but like most people are just are too polite, you know, um, it's very, very in British, isn't it? To sort of like, just sort of tut about them and just let them be your friend and see all of your, your life. We'd sooner, we'd sooner let people be our friend on Facebook and restrict what they see rather than just say no. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas yeah. realistically, yeah. it's just like, you know, there's these, these people that like, you know, I would never talk to in school. Some people that bullied me, some people that I admittedly bullied. And I'm just like, well, I'm not going to be friends with you. This is really awkward. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's not like that for, for most people. So of course, like that infiltrates your Facebook and your, your sort of, your, your infinite scroll, so to speak. And you just see it and you just kind of think, most of the time you think, oh, that's a lot of bollocks, isn't it? But it, with the fact that you've read it and it stayed in your mind, if you used to see something else, like with a, with a, a sort of a fraction of a similar sort of um, context of that post that you've seen from somebody in school, if you see that somewhere else, in your you know from a sort of more trusted source or more trusted location around you you start thinking about it more and then you'd be like okay maybe i will do a google search maybe i will do a youtube search and then of course you open up that rabbit hole of just like going in going down there and i've been down those kind of rabbit holes and they are ridiculous but you know um that's 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 how it happens and i think that's that's uh, the way it is unfortunately yeah and i think that having that kind of lack of um <laughs> that made me laugh so much about school things there are people genuinely that are pending um yeah. and it's like it's not personal i just don't know you yeah um, maybe one day one day right they come knocking at your door wearing a big foil hat that'll be great oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely going to happen and now I'm scared um, <laughs> but yeah I think obviously you know with our uh, you know yeah, Daniel mentioned echo chambers um, as well and I know that on Facebook if you are curating your friends more carefully you are going to be in more of an echo chamber mm -hmm. but then that's that's fair enough because I think obviously in your life you don't hang around with people that think of wildly course, different yeah. things from you so yeah. offline you would be in an echo chamber yeah. online you'd be in one and then I suppose the what you were saying, Danny, about seeing these people, they write these things, it sticks in your head, you're seeing it from more than one source. Then what you're creating there is that confirmation bias as well, isn't it? And yes. then I feel like then there's this gap and this divide and it's getting wider and wider and wider. And then it yeah. goes back to what Danny was saying about then it gets to this kind of violence, whether it's rhetoric or going out in the streets and doing something or saying yeah. something or arguing uh, with people. And I think another thing as well is because we're, we're using ourselves as an example, like, yeah. um, like we are, I like to, I can speak for myself, but I'm a trusted, yeah. I'm, amongst my friends, my opinion is trusted. So yeah. if, 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 if even the slightest amount of me gets pulled in by a conspiracy and I believe it, and then I start mm -hmm. talking a, to, to, about it to one of my friends, then mm -hmm. because I'm so trusted as a person and my opinion mm -hmm. is, is like held by them, then they'll be like, well, maybe is maybe he's onto something and I, I remember Daniel you said something about the the drug in America that everyone was like oh this is yeah. I like legitimately got pulled in by that I even I even put it into one of my videos and then did a bit more research and I was like yes I'm definitely taking all of that out and then I admitted <laughs> and then I admitted I admitted in the video that yeah. I did put out I was like yeah it did trick me for for like a day like realistically it really did you see I saw people 
these were people dressed in doctor's outfits on TV, thousands of them saying, we've done all this research, we're doctors. They didn't say there was doctors of like, you know, dogs and stuff like that, or like, you know, not doctors of human human chemistry. But, um, you know, I just saw it and I thought, wow, that's like, that's mad. This is mad news. And it did pull me in. Like, um, but obviously I got, as far away from that as possible but it, um not everybody's that um that inclined really do you know what i mean mm. Mm. yeah definitely and then so daniel what kind of so we talked a lot about the behavior we see online and it is a lot a lot of people saying i've done my research all right I've done my research <laughs> i watched four minutes and 47 seconds of this youtube video and i looked at an article and they don't understand you know I'm a journalist, you're a doctor, Danny's an entrepreneur, he creates content. We understand more so what research is and it's interviews, it's looking at different analytics, it's comparing data, it's speaking to sources yourself, it's gathering that, it's reading a ton of books and genuinely spending years accumulating degrees. So, but then people equate that to looking at a video once. Mm. so yeah, that's kind of behavior we're seeing online, but what kind of behavior would, how would this kind of behavior manifest itself offline? That's a really great point about the offline behavior, because of course we've talked to them about social media, mm. but conspiracy narratives have been around since the start of time. Mm. They've been traced back since f- forever. And indeed they existed and were popular without the internet. Mm. Thinking of the, the JFK cons- JFK conspiracy, which is believed by over 60% of the US population today still. And that kind of popularity has stayed throughout the time. And of course, when that conspiracy was born, there was no internet. It was via conversations in person. It was via newspapers. It was via letters to editors. It was via different mechanisms. So in a way, the internet has brought conspiracy narratives to our fingertips more than ever before. Mm But they still exist without the internet. Yeah. I'm, qu- I'm quite conv- I'm convinced that if COVID happened before the internet, there would be the same type of conspiracies existing. Mm-hmm. Indeed, uh, some research will look back to the Spanish flu, and indeed there was conspiracies around technology then to do with that flu, and the internet didn't exist then. So I think the offline behaviours are probably very similar, if not the same, to online behaviours. Yeah. Potentially, a key difference for me, I think, is that, okay... We may stay in the echo chambers off, offline, mm-hmm. but online, I can suddenly see conspiracy content on my newsfeed that I may not have been exposed to if it was just purely offline. Yeah. So obviously algorithms are looking for trends and they pick up on conversations. So with COVID, with the 5G angle, that conversation came into a kind of the mainstream consciousness because algorithms picked it up Mm -hmm. and arguably that wouldn't have happened as quickly without the internet yeah suddenly those types of narratives were were appearing on everyone's news feeds the pm was talking about it in a a press conference Mm. that i think can be seen to be the internet and how it's brought it to that kind of algorithm and it's on our facebooks Mm. so offline offline online i think they're very similar but I do think there's some slight nuances with potentially how information changes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if the internet was suddenly plugged, you know, unplugged today, the, the conspiracy narratives wouldn't go away. They would stay as popular now. It'd just be more challenging for us to talk about them. It'll be back to e- back to type into you know letters to editors and you know magazines and I don't know. Like it would still it would still exist. I mean, people would probably there'd be a conspiracy theory as to why the internet set vanished as well, wouldn't there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. It's the government yeah. took it away from us. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> So actually, you so we mentioned government. You both mentioned government there. So I don't, I don't know. This is just something that I've noticed in my own observations online. And truly, I do so much of prepping for choosing subjects I want to talk about or prepping for anything is just watching people and their behaviour online. It gives me so much, so much content, and yeah. it's unbelievable. Some of it's great. Some of it is wild. <laughs> but. One thing that I realised when I was speaking to people is like when people have all of a sudden they've lost all this trust with the government, everything else. And obviously, you know, you 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 like whatever part you like, you support whatever part you support. Why would they trust in the government so much in the first place? I don't, I don't, I'd love to understand a little bit more about that because I have worked in, I've worked in PR, I've worked in comms, I've worked for central and local government. I know, I know you don't know everything because you can't handle the truth. 
And like, you yeah. know, like in A Few Good Men, you cannot <laughs> yeah. handle the truth because you don't know how to analyze. Not everyone knows how to analyze all the information. Not everybody has the same critical thinking level and situations change constantly. Not everybody is privy to all information all the time. So are people that are believing these things and getting more upset, but they, did they just have way more trust in the government than, than people that, had, I don't know, watched 24? I mean... I would say that's it's that's a, a really difficult question to sort of answer because like it, it, like it, you're right going back years and years like there's always been this whole thing about oh especially in the UK the government is no good and they've done this they've done that and that doesn't matter what what party is in power that that will yeah. always happen um, and I think like a lot of it is and it does pain me to say it, but it's it's really true. It's like just the the, fic- the fickleness of, of people these days. I mean, you have this press cycle, as you know, like um, mm. you can easily, come on, you can sway the, the public to, to believe whatever you want to believe, you know. Mm. I mean, back in um, like 1979 was when, when Thatcher was meeting with, with press companies to sort of have these really like after hours meetings. And this sounds like a conspiracy itself, but like it's all, <laughs> this is like, this is like a, an actual thing that happened. She, she was the first PM that started meeting with press and discussing what they could do for each other. And I think that sort of has resulted in, in how we, how people see the governments today, really. Cause you know, like there is a lot of distrust, but there is also a lot of, of trust, unfortunately, um, for some and like, it's just it's just like a question that I can't really give one specific answer to. But yeah. but like the relationship with with the press and the government and the people is a very sort of vicious cycle, I would say. Mm-hmm. And what do you think, Daniel? Do you think they do you think so, people were too trusting maybe of the government before? Good question. And so it's his second hand knowledge <laughs> I'm going to pass on here. But I was speaking to a journalist last week and they were talking about how in Dublin in Ireland before COVID, there didn't seem to be that much misinformation. They didn't really talk about it often. It wasn't seen to be something that was in the consciousness of, of, of the public. But with COVID, they've noticed that misinformation has risen in Dublin. And indeed, there's actually um, right, there's actually protests happening, similarly that we have in London, which is something that they said that they've never seen before. And... This seems to be something very novel to at least Dublin. And they always, they made, it, they, made a, they made a point that they always thought that they were not susceptible to fake news. It wasn't a problem in Dublin. It wasn't a thing that, they, that had to worry them. Whereas suddenly them as a journalist was having to deal with this on a more daily basis. So I think that's kind of an interesting point of what, what was happening in Dublin before and what's happening now. Has mistrust suddenly disappeared in these gatekeepers of knowledge to the government or has something else happened? Was mistrust never there anyway? And it was just other mechanisms that were keeping this type of narrative away from that public? I honestly don't know, don't, don't know the answer to that question. But I just thought it was really interesting how that that seemed to occur. And of course, my initial response was, you know, of course, that COVID outbreak kind of breeds conspiracy narratives is what we would expect. But it seems to be, for, at least for them, something that seems really new in their society, what's happening in their, in their city, in their city. So... I think going back to polls, it'd be interesting to see how trust changes and are certain t- people trusted more? So if you ask people about the government, is that low? But ask someone particularly in the government, will they get different trust levels, like different MPs, different ministers? Will it change on that kind of level? Um, of course, you then got different the media broadly, but do you trust the BBC versus Sky News? But I wonder if it if that kind of nuance changes your beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the simple line, at least from our understanding of conspiracy narratives, is that if you mistrust, you're more likely to believe in conspiracies. Mm-hmm. But similarly, if you believe in conspiracies, you're more likely to mistrust. That relationship is very bi-directional. Yeah. That it can draw you to the narrative, but it could also make you mistrust even, even more than you did beforehand. Mm-hmm. Um, what else have they been doing? What else are they conspiring against? Yeah. Um, if they've done it once, can they do it 20 million times? It's kind of a question that, in one hand, is quite fair to ask, but on the other hand, it's it's based on information that isn't true. Yeah. And I think, you know, I mean, I know I made a joke about, or just kind of mucking around about um, watching, like, 24, or, or any or Homeland, <laughs> or something like that, and all things that are basically based on pure conspiracy and the government turning on each other and doing all these things. Mm. I suppose some of those things are, they come from somewhere. So, you know, I've said a few times, 
fact, you know, where fact meets fiction, what's true, what isn't. So how can people tell fact from fiction now? Is everything worse because of the internet? Has it removed credibility from fact and has it made us more suspicious? I'll go to Danny with that one first. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, like with, with the, the internet, I mean, um, the, uh, for example, the Brazilian president, I can't pronounce his name, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, like there, there was like, he's like got a news company that is literally going around putting out completely false stories and yeah, and like it's he's, he's basically becoming like a, a dictator over there it's it's incredible like i've only sort of followed it in the last week but like it's it's immense and i'd encourage anybody to look into it um but like yeah he now controls the press in brazil the mainstream press and that's wild that's mental you know what i mean and 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 like yes yeah, so, so like it's the the internet has, has, has well played its part in making you can, if you, like, yeah, if you have the time, you can just set up a, a sort of fake website that has links to other news websites and say that you're this, this brand or this, this influence um, with no credible checks whatsoever. And you can do that and you can just find that demographic. And, and then, of course, as Daniel said earlier, the algorithm will get find the rest of the people <laughs> for you. And, and then you've, you've, you've got, like... From from what like one story about whatever you, you choose, like you can have like tens of thousands of people like fighting your corner. From those from that ten from those tens of thousands, you can have hundreds of thousands, and then you can eventually have global reach. You know, it doesn't it wouldn't take long at all. It's like a wildfire, so to speak. Um, yeah. The internet has definitely made things worse. At, at one point, the internet was this amazing machine for for information and to reconnect people, and now it's like now it's got like a massive sort of seedy side of it, like an underbelly that's just like fake news and exploitation and and angst and you know, just like two. There's, I'd say, there's probably more negativity about the internet than there is positivity about it. The means are there, and the means are of the internet are being exploited by the wrong people. You know? Yeah, because is the internet's really a, a double-edged sword, I and mean, obviously we've seen what's happened when it comes to elections and Cambridge Analytica and yeah. all that kind of fun stuff and actually I was watching the boys recently and one of the characters Stormfront made a comment and she actually they uh, that's a part of that season sorry it's a spoiler alert but you should have watched it already but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it actually I'm not giving too much away but it because it's in trailers but they actually are really playing on that on that narrative of the of the internet and news and riling up conspiracy theorists etc in order to gain power for the people with that people that have superpowers and the uh, character actually said well why do you need 55 million people to love you you don't need 55 million people to love you you just need uh you just need five five of them to hate enough and for you to just and to hate what you hate and you feel that hate and that is it and that's how you gain the power and i suppose that's what the internet is really about isn't it you don't need the other people who believe mm. all the things you just need enough people to be angry because then you create an army and yeah. then and then they trend yeah. and then they mm. use that mm. i suppose that where i suppose it kind of taps into people that believe in conspiracy theories like you were saying daniel then it fuels that belief and mm. then it kind of it, it converts into action mm. i i totally agree with that mm. and i suppose another angle to the internet is that all totally exists and i fully agree with all that mm. But there's also the opportunity to make sure people have the facts. Mm -hmm. So there are many different fact-checking organisations out there mm -hmm. which are working hard to find the truth. And then when people Google, is climate change a hoax? They will then have that, that claim fact-checked. Mm -hmm. And at least on Google particularly, it has an option that says, is this true or false? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, false, click here. And then you click on, on that link and it gives you what the truth is and it kind of debunks whatever that particular issue is. Mm -hmm. So in a way, we can Google whatever we want and we will have it. We will have at least some fact checkers saying whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. And of course, Facebook, Twitter, etc. have, have started to introduce the function of when someone shares something that is shown to be false, it then says at the bottom, this information is misleading or it's false. Click here to learn more. Mm -hmm. So I think the Internet fully can ensure that these narratives are at our fingertips. But on the other hand, it can it also ensures that the facts are there and that when people are searching for is COVID-19, uh, you know, a government conspiracy, that the top search results will 
distinguish whether something is seen to be true or not. Mm -hmm. And questions that are, are need to be asked can be asked but then once the answer is provided by the experts and it says no covid is you know isn't done by 5g then it can be shown to be to be false so i think that's a good thing of the internet and that's yeah. something that didn't exist before when someone would have these beliefs they would write to the editor and then no one's there to debunk it whereas now i google it I then get a tout of sign. Of course, people who are motivated to believe in the conspiracy may ignore that and they're going to say, well, that 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 little post said is misleading or that's silly. But everyone else, the mainstream public, may take notice. And indeed, if we can teach people to look out for that information, to check who has said it, the credibility of that source, and then check for the consensus. So, okay, you read about this weird theory on Twitter, Google that theory and see what others are saying. Is it something that has a consensus? Are many different news organisations saying the same thing? If they're not, if it's, just, if it's just random websites, then maybe that's not necessarily the experts that we're thinking of. Mm -hmm. If potentially a whole range of different news organisations with different biases are saying the same thing, well, then that kind of gives credence. Yeah. So back to that point of, you know, the majority of climate scientists saying, yes, it is happening, is consensus and that's something that we should hold on to yeah and so you know you've made a really good point there about fact checking and obviously there are organizations that are gathering to do that now youtube facebook twitter they're now starting to remove things like people that are delivering hate speech etc but is this going to make people worse because every time i've seen the few people that i follow or, or i'm friends with online etc who really do believe in whether it's a grain of the truth or completely mm the truth in air quotes about these conspiracy theories whenever those things are taken down they all they see is that's confirming that they just don't want us mm. to know they're involved mm. in the conspiracy so as mm. fact checking increases is it just going to make other people worse or believing it more vehemently because they're like this isn't i'm not paranoid guys this is really happening is this yeah. going to make yeah what do you think danny <laughs> Um, yeah, I completely agree because, um, as as Daniel said earlier, when he was describing a conspiracy theory, it's like people um, basically they're, they're saying that it's the it's the big the big picture, it's the big people in charge that are like suppressing the the civilians and the public. And with these fact checking things, I've seen exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. You know, people are saying, well, you know, that's that's the government like trying to suppress us, trying to feed us the information that they want us to feed. Um, yeah, I completely agree that, um, yeah, that's... Uh, people, at the end of the day, like, these conspiracy theorists, people, they, they will only ever hear what they want to hear. It is very much down to the individual. And I think um, that's something that, again, Daniel touched um, on earlier. It's There needs to be a, a process where we don't write these people off, but we talk mm -hmm. to them. Because as I said, it's a lot of it is to do with the dissatisfaction of oneself and the life that one's living though mm -hmm. so that you've you can't possibly own that your life isn't going the way that you wanted to do wanted it to so you would like you can you know it's a scapegoat isn't it like i'm gonna blame the government for not allowing me to pursue my dreams as a famous actor or i'm gonna allow <laughs> I, i'm gonna like accuse the government of you know um making me live on eight pound fifty an hour and stuff like that like it's it's yeah. people need to be spoken to like on on a on a on a lower level um one on one and just be like you know it comes from yourself doesn't it you know you can only you you have to be responsible for yourself and fixing yourself and conspiracy theories shift that blame and yeah. you know it's the, the it's the weaker minded people evidently it's the weaker minded people that you know sign up to these conspiracy theories and i think mm -hmm. that's that's what we need to do we need to focus um on on the communication there because you know, investment in conspiracy theories does lead to, you know, life-threatening situations, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my thing on that. Yeah, and I think you made a really good point of, as well about not writing people off because there are things that are, there There are things that are grounded in truth. And, yeah, you know, course. And, you know, you don't have to believe everything that you're told. You do have the right to discount yeah. it and vote with your feet and look into things further, etc. But obviously not when it comes to like say lizard people which yeah, we'll yeah, come yeah, back to Danny because you know that's a personal favourite of yeah. yours but um, <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> so Daniel like based on what Danny was saying there about people and their mindset etc how I mean obviously yeah we got we have we can go from say COVID to 
government theories to lizard people, etc. How do we stop people ruining their own lives or kind of, I don't know, this anxiety taking mm. over? How can we, if mm. we have a friend and they believe mm. in something and we're like, look, maybe here's something you can do to channel it elsewhere or get some help. Like, what mm. is the next step here? I don't even know what the question is. How do we help people? <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that is a really tricky question. And that's something mm. that we are trying to understand. But I guess for me, it's having that compassion to try and understand why they've got to the point that they are. Because, of course, you may think what they believe is silly and crazy. And you might want to just tell them that. That your beliefs are so stupid. Why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. But by doing that, you're going to other them. You're going to make them... You, they're going to make them feel even more backed out and isolated from society. Mm -hmm. So I think you want to become that trusted messenger where you can have a discussion with that person. And potentially, at least in my view, if you tackle their beliefs head on, they're not going to engage with you. Mm -hmm. Potentially, if you can talk more abstract around their beliefs. So in essence, affirm their, their values based on critical thinking and get them to reevaluate their own beliefs. Maybe talk about the ingredients of a conspiracy that it's so strange. It's always about a, a, a big significant event where it's the government. Who is in the government? Who, who could do this? Mm -hmm. And try and get them to think about the logic of that conspiracy narrative to think, OK, well, maybe my beliefs could be seen as part of a conspiracy theory. Let's try and think about that slightly differently. And in essence, have the mindset that it's not a one conversation kind of thing it's going to take a period of time mm -hmm. because as we've discussed they are invested if they're going to say no i don't believe in this that's a whole change of identity mm -hmm. they change everything about themselves in essence they change who they talk to their habits on social media the pages that, that, that they like the friends that they may have that's a big significant change mm -hmm. so to suddenly change their mindset overnight is probably unrealistic it's going to be something that happens over many conversations where you talk to them about how they've got there, their beliefs, ask questions, try and help them find answers, fact check. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's a long process, but I think it's worth it. And I think the point with the internet that you mentioned earlier as well, it's a good point where just deleting things off Facebook isn't going to make them go away. Mm -hmm. Those beliefs are going to remain. Okay, they're going to stop them increasing potentially so as in people who are not believing in this already aren't going to be exposed to that so the idea that COVID is a hoax people who haven't already thought about that won't suddenly start thinking about it which i think is a good thing it will stop people getting radicalized so i think in the in the in the wide scheme of things it's a positive step to remove things like that which have offline harm but that's not the end of the story. There needs to be other mechanisms that help the people who are still going to believe those things. They're going to move on to other social media sites, potentially, to talk about the same things. Mm -hmm. So I think social media companies have a role to play, but so does other parts of society. So ensuring people have the skill sets to think critically, to ask questions, to understand evidence. You can imagine that happening in schools, mm -hmm. but then how do we target older people? People who, like me, aren't in school, like people in my, my family who, do, who, you know, go to work. How are you going to actually teach them these skills? Yeah. So, like, something that was quite interesting was uh, some research found that if they stopped people and got them to think before they shared something it stopped them sharing fake news to a larger extent. So whilst they didn't, in, didn't measure critical thinking, it did kind of hone that ability. So if I wanted to share something or retweet something, it said, are you sure this is true? Mm -hmm. And that stopping and make, make me think could stop me sharing it. Yeah. So that could be kind of a subtle way to kind of prompt people to at least stop and think. And at least in that study, it found to do a good job. Mm -hmm. And that's something that could be implemented on Facebook and Twitter. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've then got the argument of whether the Facebook and Twitter would use that mechanism. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, they're going to mo they're motivated to kind of spread it in a way because it helps their algorithms and their profits. So I guess it's the ethics of that. But there are potential things that could, that could potentially help. Yeah. Um, it's a real interesting field looking into 
interventions with fake news and conspiracy narratives and what we can do. Yeah, well, it's, oh, well I know that Facebook were testing that function out. Um, mm, okay, and they did okay, have good, some, cool. But I haven't seen it for a while, so I don't know if they were testing it. It didn't work or they just couldn't be bothered no. or it affected their bottom no, okay. line, I can imagine. And I, then yeah, people I get... It, yeah, it, mm, yeah, then mm. people get so upset about it because they're like, oh, Facebook and Twitter, they're censoring free speech. I'm like, but Facebook and Twitter never said they were the news. This is a private <laughs> company and they can do what they like, hun. You chose to be here. I'm, you just, I'm, yeah, yeah just, 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 just leave. <laughs> <laughs> Alternatively, you know when you're a kid and you get caught smoking by your mum and she makes you smoke the whole pack of cigarettes? We could no. just bump... You, what, you've never heard of that? <laughs> I've heard of it, but I've yeah. never smoked. But oh, carry on. Well, we, could, <laughs> <laughs> we could just literally yeah. sit them all down and make them believe in every single conspiracy theory, like werewolves, <laughs> lizard people, UFOs, Bigfoot, a lot, until they yeah. physically get too sick of it. Um, yeah. That's yeah. that's tough, though. That's tough, love. Yeah. I think we, we go mm-hmm. down the other route. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, I suppose it brings up so many other things that when did the fact that private companies that weren't related to news, not that news is unbiased, it's not, I'm a journalist, I know it isn't, but when did something so private, this private company become so powerful and how we let it get this powerful that it actually then changed the narratives of what people were thinking and the course of the way they were thinking and their ability to analyse information. I mean, truly, you know, and things I'm sure, there was a point where this was a conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As well. Yeah, so what do we do then when it's true? If something is true and all of a sudden, all, all, all along, people are like, yeah, you're mad. Like, even when it came to racism stuff and I was saying things about it, I remember genuinely having a conversation with someone at the beginning of COVID and saying to someone, uh, one of my friends, Ross, and we were talking about everything that happened and we were just saying that some people are really freaking out, but we were in a very, we're in a really privileged position and so we weren't freaking out as much as other people. And I was saying, but I said, you know, it's definitely affecting people who are, it's, it's affecting like uh, black, Asian, people of color more, blah, blah. And I, but then I said, well, that's because of racism though, because, and I basically explained all these things and he just changed the subject wow. because he thought, he, he, he clearly didn't believe what I said. And then a month later, the report came out that suggest that supported everything that I already knew to be true because I understand the structure of racism and I understand systemic racism in a really specific way. Um, but but then he's never actually said, "Oh, you're right." He just carried on talking to me like normal. So what do you wow. do? If, how do you react? Or how should we react when something is true and we may have contributed to gaslighting someone about it or kind of being really dismissive of their beliefs? but not when it comes to lizard people, which you will come back to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, No, I, I, I mean, it, I think it's very, it's a very complex thing. Um, and I think it can all be solved with just, just telling people to listen more to mm. each other on a one-on-one level. I mean, you can't, with, with the history of, of conspiracy theories, like, and how many have actually came true. Like in mm. 1952, Philip Morris, the tobacco company, said that, you know, cigarettes were harmless. And, you know, people believed them. People believed that inhaling smoke, when smoke inhalation was a cause of death, people still believed that inhaling smoke wasn't dangerous. And it wasn't until 1991 that they was like, oh, yeah, actually, tobacco is bad for you. Smoking is bad for you. You know, yeah. that's insane. Um, the, do you remember the, 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 the horse meat scandal in France? Like, that yeah. was a conspiracy. Mm. There's been so, there's been so, those are just two examples. But there's been so many examples of, of times when it has come true. And so, like, you can't really blame people for, for picking it up and believing it because, you know, you can say, oh, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. And they were like, well, this came true. And that was ridiculous. Yeah. People yeah. didn't believe that we was bu- yeah. buying horse meat yeah. from Iceland. People didn't believe that. People <laughs> thought it was ridiculous. But we were doing it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, I can absolutely not blame um, conspiracy theories whatsoever. But I think it can be resolved by, as Daniel said earlier, just the communication, listening to people. Mm-hmm. And sort of like having that one on one and just being like, why, why are you invested in this? And then like, yeah, just trying to, I know it's like, can be really, really long winded, but just like trying to like even write down a sort of like a brainstorm with somebody who's really in that sort of hole and sort of just get them to just get them on side, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But like, it's, it's a more complex thing than that. Um, I think yeah. it will take a lot of different areas focusing on different things to mm-hmm. actually get results. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to see where this will go. And yeah. so we'll start to wrap up now, but I still have a few questions. I'm really loving this chat. I genuinely have it for such good. a long time. Um, <laughs> but I'm still, we're still going to get through these questions, so we'll be here for a little bit longer, don't worry. Um, so why do um, some people like cling uh, to really specific conspiracy theories, but then treat things that are really wild and true as a hoax? Like, why does that happen? Why are like, people ignoring 
that like actually just just because i've said racism people are like racism is being used as a thing to cover up for all this pedophilia it's like well you know pedophilia exists we know this it's existed for for forever like racism has blah blah Mm. why are people then saying no that's not true those things aren't happening all this is a hoax because they just Mm. don't want us to think that Chrissy, Chrissy Teigen and John Legend. Got a child are, in the cupboard. <laughs> exactly, literally. And so, what? Why is that happening? I'm oh, going to ask man. Daniel that. <laughs> so, it, it, one way to think of conspiracies is that you always want to believe about in conspiracies about the other group. Mm-hmm. There's a very intergroup focus here. So, thinking of America, because it's easy. Mm-hmm. Democrats always believe conspiracies about the Republicans. Mm-hmm. And Republicans always believe about the Democrats. Mm-hmm. They never believe the, about their own group. <laughs> oh no, the Democrats <laughs> never conspire. What do you want? But the Republicans, they always do. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, with American politics, you can see the conspiracy narratives change during elections, whereby literally it, it changes overnight, the polls, where the beliefs and the popularity just merge from Republicans to Democrats. It changes over who's in office. So it kind of goes back to that mm-hmm. of who you're motivated to kind of believe is involved in these conspiracies. Mm-hmm. So with QAnon, which is obviously the, that kind of overarching belief that there's some something sinister going on with paedophile rings, is based on a grain of truth mm-hmm. by that, of course, that paedophile ring, rings do exist, mm-hmm. but it's not in the office or it's not Republicans doing it. Donald Trump isn't the person who's going to save us all and, and you know change the whole narrative. But with QAnon, it offers such an opportunity to kind of project your view of the world, Mm -hmm. whereby, okay, you may not believe in that specific part of the conspiracy, but you may believe that that's happening in the UK, that it's happening in politics politics here. You can project onto that kind of frame, which I think potentially is quite unique with QAnon. Most most other conspiracies are quite bespoke to a particular event Mm -hmm. or whatever, whereas that people talk about it in very different ways. And indeed, QAnon is very different in the UK versus America, which I think is interesting by itself. Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes back, I think it goes back to that point where you're projecting the conspiracies that fit your worldview. Yeah. And it's hated the world. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a, it's a conspiracy that has become more popular. And I think potentially it's because of COVID, but it's also because of elections, because elections also breed conspiracy narratives. Oh, yeah. It's that it's that change in our society. It's change that kind of, it's not a crisis, but it's certainly changing the status quo a little bit, mm-hmm. which can be threatening. So conspiracy narratives will always would have happened around elections, just it being a COVID time as well, kind of it's environment to really breed those narratives. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, it is what is happening. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a wild time. I don't even, I can't even with the election right now, honestly. I don't yeah, have yeah, the bandwidth right, yeah. for it. I don't have the bandwidth <laughs> this year. I'd like the next season of 2020, this is the most chaotic writer's room of any year. <laughs> if this was a TV right. show, right. I would have stopped watching. It's you, too much. Like <laughs> in, in, in like in like in like a hundred years time, 2020 yeah. will be like, it will be a conspiracy theory. This year never happened. No one yeah. will believe it. Exactly. No one will right. believe it. They were lying. No. no. And nothing so. Real. I, can, <laughs> I can understand why. If we were told this a while ago, you know, Kylie Jenner was like the year of realising stuff. I'm sure there were other people that are like, you know, all this things 2020 is going to get here and it's going to be a shit show. If someone like, told there were me so there many gonna, things. If someone told me there was going to be a fire tornado <laughs> and, this, and like plagues of locusts, which there has been this year, yeah. I would have just told them to fuck right off. Literally, <laughs> like, that, yeah, it's mental. Said, Fire tornado. Truly. That's a movie. That was a movie like a couple of years ago, and now yeah. we've had like three of them. That's crazy. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I would have thought it was something from like Power Rangers or something. It's like yeah. a fire tornado. Right. But yeah, I mean, do right. you know what? Next though, Sharknado is the next thing that's, that ha- yeah. happens. That's yeah, it. Shark- when Sharknado yeah. happens, that's yeah. it. <laughs> Sharks in a that tornado on fire. That film is mad. That film well. is mad. <laughs> Literally, exactly. In it, holding <laughs> holding guns led by Chrissy <laughs> Teigen and John Legend. <laughs> 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 But also, I mean, if we see this online next year, we know we started that here first. Right, um, she's true. She's true. She's so, true. so, yeah, so I was going <laughs> to. So, I think, like, like, we'll wrap up now. So, I'm going to go to Danny first because I know he really wants to talk about his favorite conspiracy theory. What? Lizard people. <laughs> right. So, this yeah. is like, if you haven't got time for this. Okay, so can you, wrap, can you give us a summary? Okay, so 
the lizard people thing, it is fucking wild. You know, I said earlier about the, the people saying about the two sons. So the other son is actually like, um, it's another son at the other end of the solar system. And the planet mm -hmm. there is Nibiru. And the people on that planet are Anunnaki's, I think they are. And they are lizard people. They're really fucking tall. And they have been shadow governing our world for the last, like, since... Since like the 1930s, I think it is. And they set up the um, the Illuminati and the Skull and Bones Corporations, which incorporates every single president. Funny enough, not President Trump, though. That's why people are saying that he's the hero. Like, yeah. some weird oh, shit. Anyway, um, yeah. the closer this sun gets, the closer the planet um, Nibiru that's orbiting it gets. And the gravitational pull will be so severe that basically people's brains on Earth are going to explode. <laughs> and so that's it in a nutshell. And then they're going to they're come here and they're going to like take all of our celebrities and keep them as slaves. And the rest of us are going to die. That is it in a fucking nutshell. Are there are, are, are there some here already? Is it like V? And if we yes, pull yes, this some in are here back, already. Been would we see it? They've been coming back yeah. and forth for ages, and like this is there's videos, there's these videos of like, you know, these videos are like great. They're they're real NASA videos. Obviously, they're just anomalies. But there's videos yeah. of um, one of them is called like the Black Knight, and it's like a spacecraft. And as soon as it comes into the shot, NASA cuts the feed, and people are like, well, that's it. It's they're they're here. Yeah. They're coming here, and like like it's it's so. It's so massive. It's yeah. it's unreal. Like I can't believe it hasn't got more press because like it blows. <laughs> Q in terms yeah. of subject matter and how exciting yeah. it is, QAnon has got nothing on the list of people thing. It's I, great. Why isn't this a film? It should be because right. Truly, I would watch. Or if this is a series, I'd watch the shit out of it. <laughs> yeah. <it's, laughs> like, like, like... If you if you if you have any time, go and listen yeah. to some podcasts. Um, yeah. And like, I don't believe in any of it, but it is yeah. so entertaining. And there's people, they, there's people that are obviously, they're obviously mentally ill. And they're the conspiracy theorists. These people that they call up from their homes at like 3 a.m. in the morning in America and um, wherever it's, it's recorded. And they're like, yeah, so I was looking up at the sky and like I could see the other sun. And then, you know, I just... I just blacked out and then I lost like three hours of time and you know everything in my house turned green. <laughs> it's like you know, it's some <laughs> yeah. crap like that. Oh like, there's gosh. people that are obviously they're obviously oh. mentally challenged, challenged, and yeah. they're calling up this 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 radio station just claiming to have been a victim of the incoming invasion, and it's insane. Oh, wow. That is, I mean, that is quite interesting. That is so much. Yeah. But then I suppose the thing is though, again, because 2020, <laughs> then they did have the whole NASA was like, yeah, there are UFOs. Yeah, they were yeah, three, yeah. yeah. three reveals. Boom. Yeah, three reveals. Boom. And exactly. it's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, those three reveals from the Pentagon, uh, two from the Pentagon, yeah. one from NASA, are like the biggest reveals in extraterrestrial <laughs> history. And, and the thing is, because of everything that's going on, and I'm sure you've seen me mention this in my videos, nobody's yeah. got time for that. Yeah. They yeah. had their yeah. chance. No. We don't, exactly. like, we don't, it's not about yeah. that. We're trying to survive a, a very severe chest infection right now as a, as a <laughs> exactly. whole. So, you know, <laughs> we've got better yeah. things to worry about. Truly, yeah, it just completely got swallowed up by it every did. single yeah. thing. Yeah. And then, but then that then, that then fuels the, but if they're telling us this now, what else are they hiding? Right. So I suppose it just fuels this like, well, they're mm. drip feeding us bits of information mm. just to keep us kind of, you know, and just to keep your... make us think we know things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, we'll, we'll see what exciting things happen next year. So I'm going to um, finish with uh, Daniel. What, ad what advice would you give or words of reassurance to people that are really like caught up in conspiracy theories? And it's actually like increasing their anxiety. What would you say to them? I suppose it's going back to try and think about how you got to, how you got to that point. And it's hard, but to try and really be a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. So we, we know we're motivated to defend our beliefs. So to have that awareness could be the power so that we know that when we're exposed to information that maybe goes against what we believe we feel that feeling inside where we're feeling a, a, a reaction to it we kind of stop and think through it we go okay this really goes against what i think but let's try and engage in it let's try and think about things and be critical of that post maybe but also be critical of things that also support your belief mm -hmm. if your reaction also is oh wow i love this i want to share this stop and also think about it go through that post and think through what they're saying try and fact check 
So in essence, kind of pay attention to your emotions. If you're very happy or really angry, stop and think about it. And potentially us being aware of that may help us digest this, this information mm -hmm. because the social world is a very complex place and it's not going to go away. The internet is here to stay and I'm sure it'll get even more complex in the future. So if we can kind of be aware of our reactions, it may help us in the future. Yeah. But there's still a lot to learn and these are just ideas to try and help us kind of deal with the world that we live in. <laughs> brilliant and truly who knows what might come true next month independence day i really hope not i really don't like the end of that film. no it would be all right. <laughs> <laughs> that does not go well I no mean, i mean i mean you can look at it either way the first thing that the the ufo blows up in the independence day is the white house and who's there right now so you know. uh, <laughs> he but he would have left ages ago self-preservation he would have been out there he's straight the away yeah, he's in the bunker exactly. with his lizard exactly. friend he'll is. be standing awkwardly outside of a church holding a bible pretending it's not burning his flesh it's like it hasn't burnt me it hasn't burnt me through to the bone this is what bibles are supposed to do they're supposed they're supposed to scream when you touch them so yeah it's like alright thank you so much Danny thank Thanks. you so much Daniel Thanks for having me. and yeah thank you everybody for listening Thank you for listening to Speak On. Make sure you like, subscribe and share with your friends, family, co-workers, strangers in the street. To find out more about us, including our upcoming events, head over to Instagram, instagram.com forward slash speak on underscore. Bye.